welcome from my side. Um, I'm also a co-organizer of this mini symposium. Um, together with these two guys here, you already see them in the Zoom um, panels maybe. Daniel Tembrink, also from the FOW Erlangen Nuremberg, that's where myself is from, and Leon Bungert from the Hausdorff Center of uh, Mathematics. Okay, um, I want to give a short uh, introduction into the topic or like the motivation for me or for us why we got concerned with robustness uh, of neural networks. And this is going to be a very yeah, uh, motivation by example, so to say, um, because <clears throat> we observed, or a lot of people observed actually in the last years, that neural networks uh, perform very well in different classification tasks. However, they are very vulnerable to, with respect to small input perturbations. This is, so to say, the classic, the classic um, problem with robustness. And um, we, yeah, in preparation of this talk, I explored this a little bit. And what I did, I just downloaded a, a pre-trained um, model, a ResNet, on ImageNet, and I just fed uh, the, the model some images. So the images that you're going to see now, and the predictions are actually um, given to the net. And they're not just some uh, made up numbers, but these are actually examples that I computed. And it's pretty funny, actually. So what I started with is, I mean, I have here a prediction of a, of a soccer ball. And this, this class is indeed in the image net this, uh, data distribution. So he can classify it and he does so. And then what I can do, I can compute a certain additive perturbation and is, it destroys the uh, prediction completely. As you can see, the, the soccer ball is not now in the top three um, yeah, classifications here. This is the simplest example here and showcases, okay, we can destroy the performance of neural networks with these perturbations. Um, the, the main part to note here is that the picture on the right is visually, uh, from the visual side, indistinguishable, indistinguishable for the human eye. Right? It looks the same because the perturbation is very small. It also has a very small L2 mode. Okay, this was a, the one part. One can even do this by rotations, as I found out. I just rotated the picture a little bit, and I can uh, achieve the same effect, uh, completely destroying the, the uh, performance here, getting something completely different, even with a higher um, confidence. This is also a problem. Uh, these were untargeted attacks, so I just wanted to yeah, destroy the performance. I can even do targeted attacks, so to say, perturb the image in a certain way that it uh, says something else. Here I wanted the image to classify this ball as a sombrero. That's why I added certain noise, and um, it actually gets very confident. If we compare it with the image before, where he wasn't so sure if it's really a soccer ball, now the, the output is very sure that it's a, that it's a soccer ball. So this is, has two problems. First of all, the classification is wrong and it is overconfident. Um, another point here, um, these were the classical adversarial examples. Another point of overconfidence is uh, performance on out of distribution data. So I took a face, uh, uh, an image of my face here and the ImageNet uh, data set doesn't have a dedicated human or face class. Um, and you can see the predictions on the, on the left side don't really make sense, but they are maybe also not as low as you want them to be. But even here, I can do an adversarial perturbation, and I'm now doing it in the L-infinity norm, which is even stronger. Because if you do it in the L-infinity norm, you can really fool the net to 100% um, be sure that I'm a tabby cat. And um, yeah, this is a targeted attack. And it's actually a 100%, and the network is super sure that the picture on the right is, depicts a, a tabby cat. Um, I mean, then you can have a little bit of fun with this. You can also just um, take smaller areas. This is known as adversarial stickers, which I computed here on the, on the uh, yeah, right side. And yeah, it also works, and you can even have some more fun. You can explicitly describe the shape um, of, the, of the perturbation. And what I did here, I took the sunglasses of the adversarial perturbation and then got this adversarial example uh, with sunglasses on. And there here again, it's very sure that I'm a tabby cat. I mean, this, these are fun examples and I had a lot of fun playing around with them. But actually, if you think about it, it's, this is kind of the big problem for neural network performance. Um, these and, and similar uh, yeah, observations led to an, 
yeah, really extreme increase in the interest. This is um, what I did here. I went to Web of Science and typed in the keyword adversarial robustness. And these are the number of papers per year that have this keyword. And we see the, the interest is increasing exponentially. And the thing is that not only these adversarial examples are of interest for robustness. Um, this is also what we will see within this mini symposium, that there are other parts to robustness. We have, of course, these adversarial examples. We have overconfidence, which I talked about. But we also have instabilities in semi-supervised learning. We're going to hear something about adversarial networks, which is a little bit different than, I mean, it's, it's not the same as adversarial robustness, but it has similar parts to it. And I think the most important part, of course, are theoretical analysis and guarantees, because these instabilities mainly come from the fact that we don't really know what networks do. We can train them, we can try to regularize them, but of course, in the end, we want to have some analysis and guarantees. And we're also going to have talks about this in this, uh, in this mini symposium. Actually, the fourth speaker today from San Francisco, from San Francisco is going to speak about it. Okay, so now this was a quick overview over the motivation and about the yeah, topics we want to cover in this mini symposium. I will now today talk about a very um, certain way of yeah, overcoming instabilities or analyzing instabilities in machine learning, namely via the Lipschitz constant. This is something that's concerned me for yeah, the last two years during my PhD. And as a quick recap, well, what I mean by that is just, let's say we have a function from X to Y. Um, let's say X and Y are just metric spaces, so I can measure distances. And then we call L the, uh, the Lipschitz constant, namely the smallest number L, such that this inequality um, holds. And what this means is, given uh, uh, input difference, so a measured difference in the inputs, I also want to measure or bound the difference in the outputs. This is the very basic and heuristic um, um, thing we also want to do with robustness, right? If we uh, perturb the input, we want to have a bound on how much the output can be perturbed. Okay. I'm going to focus on two parts today, namely semi-supervised and supervised machine learning. So not only on neural networks, but also on the semi-supervised uh, learning task. Here, a quick recap on what I mean by this, by this uh, terminology. Unsupervised is depicted on the left here. By this picture, I have some I have some data and I basically want to cluster it. This is not labeled. I just have unlabeled data and I want to find some, yeah, some structure, may, may be geometrical or something else, I want to cluster it. This is what I uh, refer to as unsupervised learning. Semi-supervised learning is a task. I have some labeled data on the top. So I have the data and some points of, this, some points of these are labeled. And then I want to extend this labeling to the whole uh, data set. This is semi-supervised learning for me. And then supervised is I've given data here in, in blue and green as a data set. And then I want to learn a function on the whole underlying space. This would be then a neural network. Okay. Let's start with the semi-supervised learning task, namely Lipschitz learning. What is the, what is the setting? We've given a data set, omega n. Uh, remember the picture that we just had and the labeling function g. These were like, yeah. The, these are the gray nodes, and these were the nodes with color, uh, with the labeling function G, which should be a subset of this omega n. Um, right. And, and the goal now is to learn this extension. I mean, this is what, uh, what you can see from the picture there. And what you typically do here is kind of the idea is to have the smoothness assumption, which says the points that are close to each other in a certain measure, for example, spatially, should be more likely to share a label. And what I've been working uh, with a lot lately are weighted graphs then. So I model this data as a weighted graph, it's omega n, and uh, then I have to yeah, determine some edge weights between these, between these points. And this is then the, the measurement which, uh, says me how, uh, which tells me how uh, close two points are together. This is the setting of a graph. Here's also a picture. So omega n is like the whole set. Then we have nodes that are connected to each other, and the red ones are like the labeled ones, the labeling functions. Okay. Where does uh, instability or robustness come into play here? Um, the driving question is what happens 
if the um, data or the amount of data goes to infinity, this omega n. So I get an increasingly uh, denser approximation of the underlying set. Um, and even if the labeling uh, set goes to infinity. These are the main questions uh, which I was concerned with and were also the instabilities in semi-supervised learning arrives. What you typically, typically do, or what is a very classic learning task here, is Pelaplushian learning. That is, I have the following uh, Pelaplush graph energy, as you can see here, as you can see here, depicted here. Um, we have the weighting function here to the power of p, and then we have we measure the differences of the labeling. And this is exactly the part where inherently the smoothness assumption goes in, because if we want to minimize this energy, we want to minimize um, the differences between labels that are close to each other. So if this weight um, here is important, right? This is Pelaplushian learning. This is a very um, yeah well-known task. And concerning the limit that I've been talking about, there are um, continuum limit results which show via gamma convergence that it actually um, yeah, converges to this limit problem, which you can refer to as Pilaplushian Pila learning, which is also connected to the Pilaplushian in the, in the uh, limit case. Exactly. What is the problem here? Where do instabilities, instabilities come now? Well, um, I stated it down here. For these results to hold, you have a, a dimension constraint. Namely, you need your p to be bigger than d and strictly bigger. We can see this in a very simple example. So this is a 2D example where a point cloud is labeled with two points. And if you do two Laplacian learning, so just a regular Laplacian there, you get a constant function everywhere, which just spikes at the points that's given. This is the so-called spiking phenomena. And uh, this is an instability. And this is exactly the point where the dimension constraint um, yeah, is not fulfilled. I mean, the dimension constraint also, if you're familiar with it, um, is inherently due to um, embedding results in Sobolev spaces. There you also have this, and this is also what appears here. But also in reality, in practice, we can see that this extension, this, is, uh, this um, extension that we learn here is probably not the one that we want to learn. So what is the solution? It's Lipschitz learning. Namely, what we do, we send the parameter p to infinity. That's, that's, the, re, uh, that's the solution, right? Um, I mean, if we, don't want to care, if we don't want to care about this dimensionality constraint, we just send p to infinity. And this yields two problems. Namely, on the one hand, graph infinity Laplacian learning, where on the left-hand side, I stated the graph infinity Laplacian, or graph Lipschitz learning. Um, the thing is here, you can derive two limit problems here, where the one on the left has a unique solution, while, uh, while the uh, one on the right does not emit unique solutions. However, every, sol uh, every solution from the left one, or the unique solution from the left one, um, is also a um, solution of the problem on the right. Yeah? The solutions of the left problem are also referred to as absolutely minimizing Lipschitz extensions, which we have may heard of before. And um, these are the two problems that we are going to look at now in the following. But first of all, before we do that, let's look at the actual result. Remember the picture on the left. If we do the same with the Lipschitz learning task, one or the other, we uh, arrive at this picture um, at the right. And this looks much more like what we want, right? We have kind of a smooth, it's not an interpolation, but we have a smooth, um, yeah, uh, transition here from the one uh, uh, label to the other. This is kind of what you expect here and not the thing on the right. Okay. Now concerning consistency results, this is the actually thing that we want to have here. Uh, the one we have, um, yeah, the one on the left for the graph infinity Laplacian learning is something that has been uh, there already before. Um, this is number one. This then converges to something connected to the infinity Laplacian in the limit case. And the thing on the right, which I and my colleague Leon Bungert was more concerned with, then converges to a minimize, uh, energy minimization, uh, energy minimizing problem in the limit, um, which also does not admit unique solutions. And <clears throat> as I said, the first problem, there were already some um, convergence result under stronger assumptions. Um, the main 
point here, what the strong, strong assumption is, is that uh, these frameworks only allow uh, to work with very dense graphs, so highly connected graph, which you wouldn't work with in practice. In practice, you usually work with very uh, sparse graphs, only sparsely connected, so the results in, in one may not be uh, optimal for actually um, using them in practice. And that's what we try to address in our work in, in two here, because um, we could deal with very sparse graph and very low connectivity. And um, yeah, let's just a, a quick recap of the situation here. What we do is um, we choose the weights, the, the, the weights, the edge weights here via such a kernel function. This means we measure the Euclidean distance here, and then on the outside we have a, a maybe you can see it here, a kernel function eta, and it, then it's scaled by some graph bandwidth. So this scales how much of the points. Um, in a, a certain radius we actually want to consider. This is the classical setup that you have in graph learning, and um, typical kernel functions are depicted here on the right, maybe a Gaussian kernel or like an like a indicator function. Uh, our assumptions on the kernel are very general. We basically just need that uh, it has uh, compact support, it's not increasing, and this, um, uh, this uh, restriction here on the essential supremum of t times eta. Okay. And then uh, I'm not going to spend too much time here, but the, but the important um, ingredient that you always have to do is that you have to bound the Hausdorff distance between the, your um, labeling set and the limit set and also for the, for the constraint set. Uh, this is what we refer to as delta n. And what we were then able to show here in the next slide, as you can see, was actually in another project, um, with different techniques, uh, we were able to show convergence rates. So first of all, we were able to show convergence at even smaller uh, or at even for even sparser graphs, and we were uh, even able to show convergence rates for the um, for the uh, graph infinity Laplacian, as depicted here. Um, I mean, if you calculate the rate, if you actually calculate the rates, you can see that they're not very well, that they're not too good, and they are also a lot worse than what you see in practice, but um, we were able to prove them, and it's also the first result in this in this um, yeah in this setting, uh, which allows us to work at an extremely sparse graph regime. That's what you um, that's what you want to uh, obtain. I mean, in a dense regime, the, the results are a little bit different, but yeah, we are, we are mainly interested in the sparse regime. Okay, here is also a picture of how such a process then looked like. Um, we calculate an example on what we refer to as the Newman star, which is a, a certain domain where you can explicitly calculate solutions of the infinity Laplacian, and then this is such a limiting process. This is now just a visual representation for the eye. So as you can see, we have um, prescribed these four points at the, at the, at the yeah, edges, at the apexes of the this, of this star, and then we increase the number of vertices, and um, we converge to this kind of it's not the limit function, but this is how it stops out. Okay. This was the this was the mainly the things I worked with for uh, semi-supervised learning. And uh, so this shows we were able to solve this instabilities of the Paylor Plasian um, learning framework, and we were even able to show convergence results and convergence rates. Now for the neural network park part, which I also want to talk about. Here we are now in the um, regime of supervised learning. This is we have, want to have some kind of empirical risk minimization. Again, we have two spaces x and y, a loss function on this space, and we have given data, which I uh, denote by big T. And then I want to solve this empirical risk minimization task, basically where I sum over all the data points in my in my data uh, in my given data set. What I showed you in the beginning now what we are interested with are these adversarial attacks, uh, right? They were proposed, I mean, this is a, cert a certain paper that I cite somewhere in 2014, but it goes back, of course. What you do is, if you have access to the gradient, then you can just do gradient ascent in, the, in, the direct in a certain direction that fools the net. This is the classical adversarial attack. You can also do this, white, this is now a white box attack because I have access to the gradient. You can also do this um, black box attacks where you don't have access to the gradients, but this is like the basic, the basic form we are concerned here with. And this produces these examples that I showed you in the beginning. 
And what people have done then to make uh, networks more robust against these attacks uh, is adversarial training, which basically means during training, I compute uh, or I want to have this maximal perturbation in an epsilon ball and use this for the training process. This was the adversarial training idea. And now with this in mind, we wanted to uh, do something similar for the Lipschitz constant. So we wanted to add the Lipschitz constant as a regularizer to also um, address this adversarial learning task. Now, the problem is you can't really use the actual Lipschitz constant for a neural network. It has been shown to be infeasible. It is actually NP hard to compute the Lipschitz constant for a network, so you can't really use it directly. On the other hand, what you can also do a very simple strategy, if you have a feed forward in your network, as you can see with this weight matrices, then you have a direct upper bound. Because let's say you have a um, you have a Lipschitz uh, estimate for your activation function, for example, ReLU, then it's one, and then you have a upper bound via the um, via the norm of all these matrices. So you can add uh, your the norms of your weight matrices just as a regularizer. This works, but it is a very poor approximation of the Lipschitz constant, and it tries to overestimate the Lipschitz constant. Uh, yeah, that's that's what you observe. So what we wanted to do is take this idea of adversarial training, this means um, have a finite discrete set uh, where we can approximate the Lipschitz constant. And this is what we want to add as a regularizer then. This was our starting point. So what we did, we came up with a very simple um, algorithm. Let's say we have some initial uh, weight functions and an, uh, this Lipschitz set where we want to approximate the, lip, uh, approximate the Lipschitz constant. Then we do a regular update of the, um, of the neural network, but plus this regularizer on this Lipschitz set. Okay, um, this of course is a regularization strategy, but the question is, um, it's only as good as the expressivity of this set, of course. So we also have to find a good Lipschitz set. Uh, and what we did there, we just did in each step a uh, gradient ascent in the Lipschitz direction. This is how we did the, did the uh, updated the Lipschitz set. And this is a simple algorithm that we came up with. And uh, let's just uh, have a simple example of what it does. I took, uh, I've taken two pictures here on the fashion analyst example. And then I do this um, Lipschitz as, uh, ascent. And then what happens is they go near each other, of course, and they get to a point here where they are um, very close to each other. And we have a very high Lipschitz constant in this region because you can see the picture on the top is very confidently um, predicted as a shirt, while the picture on the bottom is very confidently depicted as a trouser. And while, of course, both of these pictures are not actually in data, so they both have, should have low, confi uh, low confidence. Okay. Yeah, this is a similar picture. And now if we use this training idea in a simple 1D regression example, so what we did here with this regularization parameter lambda, you can see on the bottom right here, if you don't do any regularization, you get high Lipschitz constant, you get instabilities in this green part here. And then if you increase the parameter, this is now trained with our um, with the algorithm that I proposed, then I mean if you see here, for example, you get a better fitting of the of the data even and it's smoother and the Lipschitz constant, uh, at least locally smaller. If you do it too much, then you get worse results. Okay. We also tested this on MNIST and Fashion MNIST. And I mean, the first results that we have in here uh, depict that it works. It works better than the normal weight regularization that we've shown, but the, but the tests are, uh, in this case, um, yeah, not, not, not done yet. They need, uh, we need to do more experiments. But this first experiment show the algorithm works, and it can help to fight against adversarial attacks. Um, Sorry, yeah, yeah. You will have to wrap up because the time. Yes, is that, uh, that's good. This brings me already to my conclusion. So what I discussed today is a motivated. Um, yeah, uh, why we need robust neural networks. I showcased where we can use the Lipschitz constant in semi-supervised learning and supervised learning. The outlook for me is to obtain even better theoretical convergence rate for the semi-supervised task. Then this Lipschitz uh, training that I did in the end. I want to, we want to obtain a more sophisticated strategy, and we also want to have more in-depth analysis of the regularization effect.
yeah, an outlook of the of the mini symposium again, um, just very quick. I mean, we're gonna see different um, methods to fight against these adversarial attacks. We're gonna see regularization beyond the Lipschitz constant that we that I just proposed. We're gonna have theoretical robustness guarantees in the next few hours, and we also see a lot of um, tasks where robustness is depicted beyond adversarial attacks. Okay, this brings me to my end. If you want to check out the code uh, for the examples that I that I produced, we have a GitHub. You can um, yeah just just uh, go there and try out the notebooks. The code is there, and you can play around with the examples. Okay, thank you.